so now we're going to take this this air pressure, this wave of air pressure, and turn it into actual mechanical energy to, to move bones. And the bones are tiny bones, so they're ossicles. They have very little weight. It doesn't take a ton of energy to move them, but they're still, uh, they're still masses. And so it's still going to take uh, energy, and we're still going to lose energy. We're going to lose energy in this transformation no matter what we do. Uh, and so as this, as this tympanic membrane moves back and forth, it moves the malleus, which moves the incus, which moves the stapes. And each one of these is connected to the next. We're going to lose energy in this transfer, but we don't lose as much as, po as, as we would otherwise because there is a huge reduction in the amount of surface area that the pressure is operating on. So you're concentrating energy onto the tympanic membrane uh, onto a much smaller surface, the oval window. So this is about, a, a, this is causing a, a 14 times concentration of energy just due to the uh, change in, in surface area. So there's 14, more, uh, 14 times greater pressure per square area here than there. And that allows us to lose less energy than we would otherwise. And there's another uh, um, feature of the ossicles that we won't go into, which brings it to about a factor of 15. So you're going to lose it, but you're going to lose uh, 15, 15 times less than what you would lose uh, otherwise because of, this, uh, because of these two um, features of the middle ear. Now, the middle ear has... Besides the ossicles, it has two um, muscles. And these muscles are, remember, they're branchial motor muscles. Uh, the tensor tympani is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. And when it's relaxed, the, uh, the, the malleus is on to the tympanic membrane. But when it's contracted, it pulls the tympanic membrane. So it stretches the tympanic membrane. And as we alluded to before, when you stretch the tympanic membrane, it's just the same as stretching a drum, tightening the drum, the, uh, a drum, which, in which case the sound that you get from beating the drum now is at a, at a higher frequency. So what you got before, the frequency out, out of the tympanic membrane was the same as the frequency in. And now when this is contracted, the frequency is higher uh, than the incoming uh, f uh, sound frequency. What's the, what's the import of that? Well, this is, this is not a reflex, but this, uh, this tim uh, tensor tympani muscle is engaged at the same time that chewing muscles are engaged. And remember that the trigeminal nerve innervates both chewing muscles and the tensor tympani. So cute little um, package deal there. You start to chew, you also tighten the tympanic membrane. The result is you're chewing, and the chewing sounds can conduct through bone, not through the external ear, but through bone, all directly to your cochlea. But they're very bass sounds. It's like it's, like, it's the same as um, a car door uh, vibrating. That's a low sound. Well, chewing sounds, bone bone conducted sounds are low. Um, and now you want you want to chew and also listen to your uh, your dining companion, who is speaking at normal speech frequencies, and those speech frequencies are now going to be elevated because they're coming in through the external ear, and they are now they're not coming directly to the cochlea, they're not bypassing the external ear, they're coming in through here, and now because they have to go through the middle ear. They go through this tightened tympanic membrane. They're elevated. And now you can distinguish speech uh, more readily from your own chewing sounds. The other uh, middle ear muscle is, uh, is the uh, stapedius. And the stapedius simply uh, is a muscle that is going to pull back on the stapes. It is the stapes. It is the movement of the stapes that's going to set up the sound waves uh, in the cochlea. So the sound waves are going to become fluid waves in the cochlea just by the, the beating of this, of this stapes on the, uh, on the window of the cochlea. 
the stapedius is just going to pull it back and not enable the stapes to push on on the window as as um, with as much force. And so this is going to dampen sounds. It's going to it's going to make sounds less loud. It's going to decrease the magnitude of the incoming sound wave. The um, when does this occur? You cannot make it occur. You can't willfully do it, and you can't start chewing to do it. Or you can't start doing anything to do it. It occurs when there is a loud sound. And the, the, uh, I think the, the, um, the situation under which this uh, evolved is that when there's one loud sound for one moment, and it, this is a really fast, fast system, if there's a loud sound at this moment, there's, really gonna, there's very likely that that loud sound is going to continue for a little while. So we had a thunderstorm here in Chicago last night. When there's a peal of thunder, it lasts for seconds. And what you do is you use that first instant to tell you that there's an unexpectedly loud sound, contract the stapedius, and then the loudness of the rest of the thunder peal is going to be diminished. You've pulled back on the stapes. Um, this is a reflex. Uh, and. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting one. And this is the one that it, when the stapedius is not working, let's say because cranial nerve 7, which innervates the stapedius muscle, let's say that you have a Bell's palsy. The result of that will be hyperacusis. Sounds will be too loud on the side of, of the Bell's palsy. Um, and, and the stapedius is, is engaged when you get to about 70 dB, which is a loud conversation. So if I speak loudly, that would be around 70 dB. So it, it's engaged uh, relatively frequently. Um, and, uh, and so you'll, you'll know it if you experience hyperacusis. Hopefully you don't. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the inner ear.